everybody. I'm going to try and keep us on track if you could find your way to your seat uh, so that we can uh, get started with our, our, the rest of our program. For everybody um, tuning in online, um, I just wanted to say hi. And uh, I, I just wanted to say hi. Oh my God, thank you, Marty. I can hear the difference. Um, <laughs> Okay, I just have to keep reminding myself to hold it up higher. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, we uh, are going to try and keep on track um, today, and I know that um, you know uh, this is uh, the session between um, you and lunch. But um, it, you know, if there had to be a, um, a session, it should be this session between uh, between us and lunch. I am so very pleased and happy to introduce you to David Wiley, um, who has had some harrowing experiences getting here. Um, and, uh, you know, who would think that, you know, you'd have to be rerouted from uh, coming from Utah to, to um, Atlanta by going through Detroit. You would think that it would be the opposite. But in any case, he is here. Um, and um, uh, so without any further ado, uh, David Wiley is the Chief Academic Officer of Lumen Learning and um, also um, at adjunct professor mm -hmm. at Brigham Young. Brigham Young University. So thank you very much for being here, David, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So that was really, that was really exciting when she said that I had a harrowing experience. I thought you were going to say I had hair, which was... <laughs> Terrific. I was, I was going to be really excited about that. Okay, I, I didn't know what to title this talk. Um, so I apologize that you've got this bland kind of thoughts on open title, but that's kind of where it landed. I've been working it and reworking it, um, you know, listening to what Dave said this morning. I, I was able to hear Kyle yesterday um, and trying to fit it in with what you've been talking about so far. I should say, as prelude, of course, we're at an open conference. The slides are openly licensed. Um, the notes and attributions for all of the images, the attributions for all the images are in the notes. Um, so when you download the slides, you can find all the attrib attribution information there. And I want to say that I'm super excited to be talking to what I consider my people. It, it's not very often that I get a room where there are a lot of instructional designers in the room. Yay, instructional designers. My PhD is in instructional psych and tech, and I consider myself kind of originally and primarily an instructional designer, so it's fun to be with you and think that way. First, first bundle of thoughts is around innovation. Um, if you don't know Eric's work on democratizing innovation and Adam's work on permissionless innovation, I'd really encourage you to at least go hit a website and you know, get the summary, if not buy the book. But at least Eric's book, you can download its Creative Commons license also. You can just grab a copy of it. Um, Eric's at MIT, Adam's at George Mason. And the idea, between, the idea behind democratizing innovation is that technologies and opportunities and communities, so some of the things that Dave was talking about earlier this morning, are coming together in a way that's making it possible for all of us to participate in the innovation process from a, from a technological standpoint, for example. Whereas Adam is talking about this idea that we need to clear out any kind of regulatory or policy barriers to our ability to innovate. And I want to follow these two threads, kind of democratizing innovation and permissionless innovation, through some thoughts on open. Uh, but I want to connect it to what's probably my favorite quote um, in terms of framing the way that I think about this work, a quote by Linus Torvalds. Um, I will go ahead and break the first rule of PowerPoint for those of you in the back who might not be able to read it, and I will read it to you. Linus says, don't ever make the mistake, and you get this weird ASCII emphasis because this was written in an email. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you can design something better than what you get from ruthless, massively parallel trial and error with a feedback cycle. That's giving your intelligence way too much credit. Um, and I think you see here in this idea of the feedback cycle, um, some of this notion of permissionless innovation. I'll connect that in a minute. And the idea that the trial and error is massively parallel um, ties into the idea of this uh, democratized innovation. 
as well. I want to talk for a minute about the, the role of infrastructure in enabling innovation and connect this back to open education. And when we think about infrastructure, we think about roads and water and power and, and the internet. Um, when infrastructure is reasonably inexpensive and when we're provided with broad permissions for how we use it, it enables innovation. So look, think about a couple of counterexamples. Imagine if broadband cost $500 a month or if broadband cost $5,000 a month. Would Amazon even exist? Would Google even exist? Would online courses exist if it cost $500 to get on the network? So that the relative inexpense of this core piece of infrastructure that we call the network is really key to enabling these kinds of innovative things that are happening. Likewise, think about if you were required to have and maintain a broadcast license to publish videos online or to live stream like we're doing today. We're broadcasting today. Imagine if we had to obtain a broadcast license to be able to do that as if we were a radio or as if we were a television station. Um, does YouTube exist in that kind of policy context where there are lots of permission hurdles that are required before we can innovate? Does Twitter exist if you need a broadcast license to publish text? Again, do online courses exist if I can't publish video and text and things like that online without a broadcast license? So you know, innovation thrives when the cost and obstacles to experimenting are low. Innovation is all about experimenting, trying things out, trying to discover something new, something that works better than what we currently have. So let's connect this back to education directly for a minute. And I want to propose to you that the core pieces of our infrastructure in the education space are these four things. Um, you might prefer the term objectives or competencies. I've put outcomes in the box. I'm not religious about the language you may be. I respect your faith in that regard. Okay? But learning outcomes you know, what is it that we want our students to learn? And it's whether what we want them to learn, or as Dave was saying earlier today, what do they want to learn? But we need some sense of what the goal is. What's the learning goal? Uh, you know, assessments. What can the student do to demonstrate to us, to cause us to believe, to persuade us that they've achieved the learning goal? What kinds of resources can we provide them? Activities to ask them to engage in that can help them actually get to the place where they can succeed in the assessment. And then once they've, once they've learned what they wanted to learn or what we wanted them to learn, they've demonstrated that through the assessment, what kind of credential are we going to award for them? Whether we're talking about face-to-face -face instruction, online instruction, blended instruction, no matter what kind of instruction we're talking about, I want to argue that you need these four pieces. These are the infrastructure uh, for education. The problem is that these are opposite of the infrastructure we were talking about a minute ago, these are relatively expensive and come with very, very narrow permissions. Um, you know, on the relatively expensive side, if you have a significant amount of capital, then you can conduct all kinds of experiments in this space. You can go license a bunch of content from Pearson and import it into your platform because you're Newton and you've raised $100 million or, or whatever you've done. Or you can go write a big grant and get a couple million dollars and build all your own content from scratch um, because you had access to that the capital through that grant funding. Um, but it costs a lot and only people with a lot of money seem to be capable of innovating in this space. A couple of views of cost issues when it comes to things like assessments and resources. You've probably all seen this graph. This version is from The Economist. Textbook prices up 1,500% over the last couple of decades compared to the price of other consumer goods up only 500%. Um, as I was searching for textbooks, <laughs> when I was searching for that economist graphic, I found a couple of these EE cards that were just too funny and I had to throw them in uh, to the deck. I like this one even better. <laughs> you know, there's just a default implication that, that I am selling drugs. Uh, and if textbooks get more expensive, I'm going to sell those instead of the drugs, which I'm currently selling, apparently. That one just really cracked me up for some reason. 
I apologize. I'm going to be drinking a lot because I'm fighting a, a little cold, so I, I apologize for that ahead of time. Um, you know, Cerritos College is a, a college in California. This is one of the programs. I'll, um, I'll withhold the, the details to protect the innocent. But here's a situation in which the cost of textbooks in a year cost more than tuition does. This is my personal favorite way to think about it. Um, you know, I can, I can rent one month streaming access to a biology textbook for $20 a month. Uh, or for $16 a month, I can rent streaming access to every movie and every TV show ever created with a, a Netflix subscription and a Hulu subscription. So you put those two things on the balance, on the scale. You got tens of thousands of movies and TV shows on one side and a single textbook on the other. And actually the textbook costs more for a month of streaming access. Any Ursula Le Guin fans in the room? Nice, represent Ursula K. Le Guin fans. All right, so long, a long time before Harry Potter ever went to Hogwarts, um, Ursula Le Guin sent this young man whose uh, username was Sparrowhawk to the island of Roke to study wizardry. And one of the techniques that, the, that they had them use there in studying was memorizing these long lists of the true names of every plant and rock and geography and all these things. And these lists of names were written in ink that disappeared at midnight every night. So the master namer would write out the list of names you needed to learn today, provide it to you, and at midnight the ink would disappear. And either you'd learned it or you hadn't, and you better have learned it because um, it was bad if you didn't. Why, why does Ursula K. Le Guin appear in the middle of this little bundle of slides on pricing? She appears here because I think on our campuses what we have tended to do in response to the ridiculous, immoral, unethical price of textbooks is we've asked students to employ a disappearing ink strategy, which is to say, don't actually buy a book, or if you do, certainly don't plan on keeping it. At the end of the semester, sell it back to us. We'll buy it back from you. Or, or actually just rent it in the first place. Don't even buy it. Or just get this ebook, uh, which has some DRM where the book deletes itself after six months. Or, or rent the, get a subscription to this online service that's good for 180 days. In each of these circumstances, the student loses, act, the ink disappears at the end of the semester. And on the one hand, we're telling them, this course is so important, you cannot graduate unless you take it. And on the other hand, we're saying, this is so unimportant, you, you don't need to plan on owning this book or ever referring to it again, ever in the future. Just sell it back to us. It's, it's a mixed message that we're sending. Um, you know, on the assessment side, just this one slide is probably enough. These, there have been a lot of questions raised about Pearson's testing contract with the state of Texas, which I think is a $486 million contract for Pearson to provide some standardized tests just in a single state. So it's not, it's not inexpensive. And then in addition to the costs, very, very narrow permissions, opposite of what we would want to see in an infrastructure that's going to enable a lot of innovation. These, <laughs> if you ever want a good laugh, if you're just bored, you know, waiting for your, the next TV show to come on or something because you don't have anything to do, you're done grading all your papers, <laughs> go hit pearson.com slash permissions and look at the very easy 3,000 step process you, you go through <laughs> in order to get permission to reuse anything of Pearson's. Not only do you need to make your, your request in writing here, but it actually has to be sent to the appropriate person. They're not going to forward it on to the person that it belongs to. You have to do it in writing using one of these forms, submit it to the right person, include the title, author, ISBN, exact pages and number of copies you're going to use, intended audience, how many persons will view the content ever, the dates during which they may view the, I mean, th this is what you have to do just to request permission. And then of course you have to pay you would have to pay. If you could successfully navigate this maze, you would end up having to pay. And these are the terms of use from Coursera. Um, we think of Coursera, um, some people refer to Coursera as a MOOC. One of the O's in MOOC ostensibly stands for open. We think of Coursera as being open. I, I would guess I'm probably the only kind of terms of use geek in the room, but how many people have read the full terms of use on the Coursera site? 
I just, I just highlight this one little section for you. And again, because it's small, I apologize to you in the back of the room, so I, I will read. You may not take any online course offered by Coursera or use any statement of accomplishment as part of any tuition-based or four-credit certification or program for any college, university, or other academic institution without the express written permission of Coursera. Such use of an online course or statement of accomplishment is a violation of the terms of use. So when you as a faculty member have a student that comes in that's a little, you know, needs a refresher on something and you say, hey, you know what, just go do the first four weeks of this Coursera course and you'll be caught up. When you direct a student to do that, you're directing them to violate the terms of use. You cannot use anything on the Coursera site in conjunction with any four credit uh, or tuition based program. So not only is it all rights reserved, it's even more restrictive than the New York Times, or more restrictive than National Geographic. It's more restrictive than the BBC. It, they're explicitly telling you it's against the terms of use for you to use Coursera in association with any kind of formal education program. Bet you didn't know that. Well, permissions are critical. And I'll just, just one slightly goofy example, if you'll permit me. Um, I think you're all familiar with this quote by Newton that, uh, about standing on the shoulders of giants. I think when you take this kind of Coursera approach overreaching strong copyright, it's like putting spikes on your shoulders. Like you are aggressively saying, no, you are not allowed to stand on my shoulders. You may not see further. You may not build on what I was doing. So we end up in education. We end up hiding behind fair use. We end up hiding behind the Teach Act. We end up hiding behind these exemptions in the law and saying, well, it's my class and the door is closed and who, who cares what happens uh, when the door is closed. And you, you may be well within your right of fair use or within a right that's covered by the TEACH Act when you do that. The problem is when all the innovation has to stay quiet and stay hidden, it can't build and it can't grow and ne network effects can't happen and it can't turn into something more magical. So this, the education infrastructure these pieces, things like learning outcomes, like exams, like textbooks, are expensive and don't come with permissions. That's exactly the opposite of the set of characteristics we'd want an infrastructure that was going to facilitate a lot of innovation to have. So when you have trouble with costs and permissions, your first thought should be the solution to costs and permissions is open. What would an open education infrastructure look like, where outcomes were open, where assessments were open, where the resources were open, where the credentials were open. Now, I'm not going to talk about credentials because Kyle did a great job of that yesterday and you heard that and I thanked him today for giving a big chunk of my talk. So I don't have to talk about open credentials at all. Um, let's just talk about outcomes and assessments and resources for a minute. Um, if those things are to be open, that's great. Um, but which open and what do we mean by open? And this is a point that I think is worth spending a little time on. There's this kind of rough sense that open is approximately the same as free. Um, that is an under conceptualized version of open. That's a version of open that leads us down a troubling path. I mean, the entire internet essentially is free. BBC is free, National Geographic is free, CNN is free. I, I, I don't have to pay to read most of the things I read on the internet. I think free is kind of assumed. When we talk about open, we really ought to be talking about free plus permissions. And here you see the connection back, this idea of cost plus permissions. I would suggest to you that when you think about open, you define it in a very, very specific way with these two parts to the definition. The first is that there's free and unfettered access to whatever it is we're talking about. Not only do I not have to pay, but I don't have to create an account. I don't have to give my email address. I don't have to give my zip code. Like Google could just find and index this free and unfettered access to the material and a perpetual irrevocable grant of the set of permissions we call the 5R permissions. 
which are permission to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Now, some of you may be familiar with this list before retain was there when we used to call it the four R's. Um, call it the five R's now have added the idea of retain. And retain is really fundamental. Um, you know, if you can't make and own a copy of the video or the textbook or the syllabus or whatever it is we're talking about, if all you have is some kind of streaming access to it, that with streaming access, you can't modify and adapt and localize. You can't remix and do those kinds of things. You certainly can't confidently share with others because the link might go away tomorrow. This idea that you need to be able to make a copy and own that copy and control it yourself is fundamental to being able to exercise these other permissions. So call these the five R permissions. And when I start talking about perpetual and irrevocable and things like that, that should make your mind go straight to the Creative Commons licenses. By show of hands, familiarity with Creative Commons? Okay, that's, that's kind of what I figured. Great. That's good. Not going to say a lot <clears throat> about Creative Commons except to make a couple of comments about some popular licenses. This, the top license here is buy in CSA. The comment I would make here about buy in CSA is that no one can tell you what non-commercial means, including Creative Commons. In fact, Creative Commons um, ran a big study that was funded, was it, it was funded by Mellon, Candace, is that right? I, I, want, I want to say it was funded by Mellon. Anyway, where they brought, they did a huge survey internationally of the users of the Creative Commons license to find out what the community thought non-commercial meant, because Creative Commons couldn't figure out what non-commercial meant, so they surveyed the community. And the community, basically, every person that answered had a different answer. Um, so there's significant ambiguity about what non-commercial means. And because there's ambiguity about it, I don't know if what I want to do with it qualifies as commercial or not. So if you put an NC term on your open material, I'm probably not going to use it, because I don't know if what I want to do counts in your mind as commercial, because there is no canonical definition of commercial, even from Creative Commons side. So this ambiguity makes people scared to reuse material that are licensed that way. Second license down is the uh, by SA, the attribution share alike license. The comment I would make about this license is that the share alike clause creates a significant number of compatibility problems just between the Creative Commons licenses themselves. This is a chart from the from Creative Commons website uh, showing materials that are licensed in which ways, uh, showing which materials licensed in which ways can be remixed with other materials. And you can see that almost half of the intersections of the different license combinations here have X's in them, meaning that you can't remix these two different open materials that are both licensed with the Creative Commons license. Um, and a lot of these issues have to do with the share alike clause. The bottom license is the attribution license. That's the license that currently is mandated by most foundations. If you have Gates money, if you have Hewlett money, uh, you have to uh, distribute the things that you create with that funding with, uh, uh, under the attribution license. If you had TACT money under the Department of Labor grant program, it requires the attribution license. This is the license that most modern projects, or anything that started since 2008 or 2009, is really using the attribution license. And if you're using a different license, I would strongly encourage you to upgrade from either buy SA or buy in CSA to buy, to have that conversation with whoever's on your team and think about doing that. So when we talk about an open education infrastructure, open learning objectives, open assessments, open textbooks, open videos. Uh, I hope when you think about open in that context, you think about this two-part definition, free and unfettered access, perpetual and irrevocable permission to engage in the 5R activities. Um, probably the, the biggest enemy of open is FOPEN. Faux, <laughs> faux open. Um, and the characteristics of things that are FOPEN are that, A, they use the word open to describe themselves. Um, and they are free, but they probably gate access. And they're certainly all rights reserved. 
and we could point at a hundred things right now that describe themselves as open, but are free, gated, and say all rights reserved at the bottom. That is not open. That's what we might call open washing, like greenwashing. Um, we used to talk about. I think it's more fun to call it open, though. When you see something that describes itself as open, take a look at it and ask, is there some gate between me and these materials? Do I have to provide some kind of personal information? Certainly, do I have to pay? And what's, what are the terms of use? What's the copyright statement like? So hopefully, in, through that little kind of river of, of thoughts there, I want to persuade you that open, because of this two-part definition of things being free and things having these broad permissions like the permissions that are provided by CC BY, open actually does democratize uh, innovation. And it permits innovation in terms of this idea of permissionless. So Dave made a comment this morning. He said, I can't remember exactly what it was. Dave, maybe you can remember exactly what it was. He said something about educating in all the ways enabled by the internet or some kind of broad kind of visionary statement like that. What's that? I said it was like that, but smarter. Mm. No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Like that, but smarter. I want to talk about this idea for a second and tie it back to open as well. When you think about all the educational possibilities that are afforded us by the internet, um, they are many, and the vast majority of them are unavailable to us. And, and let me say why. Long, very long, before the internet was a gleam in an engineer's eye, there was this thing called copyright. And copyright has to do with permissions, as you know. And when you think about all the things that copyright regulates, right? copyright broadly regulates four kinds of activities. Two of those are actually making copies and distributing those copies. Back in the day, back before the printing press, it was really expensive to copy a book and get it sent across the country. Bless you. Is there another coming? We'll, we'll, we'll bless you again. They normally come in twos. Um, you know, after the printing press, that cost drops dramatically. And in the context of the internet, it drops so dramatically as to essentially be free. To make a copy of a digital file is basically free. To move that copy from here to there is basically free. But, but you'll notice that copyright, long before the internet came along, copyright was already regulating, already telling you that you didn't have permission to make copies and distribute them. So in a sense, there's something very fundamental going on here in that a broad part of what the technology, the internet, enables us to do, the law prohibits us from doing without going through some kind of crazy maze of permissions like that Pearson page that I showed you a few minutes ago. And of course, the record, the, the music industry kind of learned this lesson. The movie industry is still sort of trying to learn this lesson. But there's a tension here, a very real tension between what the technology enables and what the law allows. Um, so a short story, again, if you'll permit. So all these stories I have to start with once upon a time. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there's this beautiful kingdom with happy meadows of beautiful wildflowers and a little house hiding in the back. And uh, into this beautiful kingdom uh, was introduced the automobile. And the automobile was terrific because it made it so that people could get places and they could do things and go further and see their family. And it had lots of great positive outcomes, but it had some negative outcomes as well. And one of those negative outcomes was it kind of tore up the beautiful land of the kingdom. And so some people got together and said, what can we do? Uh, you know, to mitigate this, and they said, we, well, let's, let's just make a rule that says we're going to declare some of these things that have developed. We're going to call them roads. We're going to say that if you're going to travel in a motorized vehicle, you have to stay on a road. That's a law. And if we do that, then people can travel and they can do all the things they want to do, and we can minimize the damage to our beautiful kingdom. Well, a couple of decades later, someone invented the airplane. 
and they said, this is, this is awesome. This is going to let us go even further, visit more of our family. It's going to be terrific. Um, this amazing technological innovation until someone reminded them that actually the law says all travel by motorized vehicles must stay on the road. So here you have this great piece of tech in completely you know, hampered and encumbered by this old policy that was created before the time of the tech, was never really reimagined for the tech. Um, it's a problem. So I want to suggest to you, bringing our story back, that when you're teaching online or when you're teaching in a blended way or using the internet at all in your teaching, if you choose to adopt instructional materials or assessments or things that have a traditional copyright on them, you are choosing to drive the airplane down the road because the law, the, the copyright of those materials does not permit you to do all the things with them that the internet actually enables you to do. However, if instead you were to choose openly licensed materials and use those materials in your teaching that is technology enhanced or technology enabled, at that point you actually get the plane into the air and you're able to do some more, you're able to take advantage of all the affordances of the internet at that point. So everything that technology enables us to do, making the choice of open gives us the permissions to do. So we're not fighting against the law all the time here. So this idea of, um, this idea of open, I really want to persuade you, and I would be more energetic if I hadn't only slept an hour and a half on a red eye <laughs> in a seat two rows away from a medical emergency. I mean, it was such an amazing trip here. Um, I would be slightly more articulate, so I apologize that I'm not. David was definitely smarter today. Um, this idea is worth defending, and it's worth defending really vigorously. I would be more energetic in my trying to persuade you of that if I were more energetic. Um, you look at it from the student side. Let me pull in some student data here. So there's a, I think there is, dare we say, a causal chain here from issues of cost to which become issues of access and those issues of access become issues of student success outcomes. So because of the rate at which textbook costs are growing and the amount of money that students are required to pay for them, they simply go without them. Um, and they take fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. And when they don't have the required material that they need for your class and they're taking fewer classes, then you tell me why we measure graduation rates from four-year programs on a six-year time frame. I, I wish I knew why we measured it that way. Measure it on a six-year time frame and still at that point only 33% of students are graduating from open access institutions four-year program finishing in a six-year time frame. And less than half of all the students that go to community colleges ever achieve the credential goal that they entered for. So this cost issue becomes an access issue which contributes to an outcome issue. So think again about open. Think about this idea of an open education infrastructure. What if costs were dropping and the annual average cost of textbooks for a student was less than $50? or was zero dollars, or some other small amount, and no students went without access because of cost, and no students took fewer classes because of cost, what would happen over on the outcome side? So I want to share a few thoughts with you here with some research that my, uh, my group at BYU has been working on over the last couple of years. Because there is this pervasive assumption that you get what you pay for. Right? Open sounds really great because it sounds like it would be free and it sounds like it gives me all these great permissions, but there is no way. There's no way that a bunch of free junk I download off the internet can be as instructionally effective as a 1,200-page, glossy paper, full-color, hardback, professionally laid out and edited publisher textbook because you get what you pay for. You know you get what you pay for. That's been drilled into you all along. Well, let me try to pr provide you with some counter examples here. The first is from a project um, called Project Kaleidoscope, 
this was uh, Next Generation Learning Challenges, a grant-funded project that initially involved eight institutions and then later grew to include 28. Um, and what we did at those eight institutions was we supported and helped them through the process of getting rid of the commercial textbooks they were assigning students and helped them instead aggregate open educational resources around their learning outcomes, use the learning outcomes as a table of contents for a textbook replacement, and build something custom out of existing OER around, um, around those learning outcomes that they were trying to teach to. So in this particular study, you can see there's about 5,000 treatment, 12,000 control students, 50 different undergraduate courses taught by 130 different teachers at eight institutions. Um, this hasn't appeared in print yet, but it's been submitted, and we, we're quite hopeful about it. Um, what we're looking at here is what happens when faculty are assigning OER in place of commercial textbooks and when faculty are assigning uh, commercial textbooks. It's not a true experimental design study, but we did use uh, propensity score matching, which basically goes back in here and says for every one of these guys, let's go find somebody in here that looks just like that one and pull somebody out and put them in a sub-control group. So you end up with... 5,000 treatment and 5,000 control because we've matched somebody one for one out of the control group to every person in the treatment group. So it's not true randomization, but uh, you know, it's a very good substitute. And then in this case, you know, we're looking at completion rates, the, the rate of completing with a C or better, and coming back to this issue of you know, taking fewer courses due to textbook costs, also looking at the number of credits that students are enrolled in this term and next term. And you know, a pretty slim set of covariates here, but at least uh, controlling for age, gender, and race. And what we see here is that for students who are in classes where faculty members assigned open textbooks instead of commercial textbooks, completion rates are higher, C or better rates are higher, and in each case, this term and next term, students who were assigned open textbooks were taking on average a little more than one credit more than the students whose faculty members had assigned them commercial textbooks. Um, another quick example. This one's already published. This is an Educause review. It's from some work with Mercy College. Anybody from Mercy in the room? Um, so Mercy College, this was not, not nearly the, a, as diverse a set of gen ed courses as we were looking at a minute ago. This is a smaller set uh, just of math courses. And this was moving. Uh, moving a class from a textbook and, and My Math Lab bundle, which is about a $170 bundle, to OER in place of the textbook and an open source system similar to My Math Lab that generates homework problems and provides automated feedback and has a video instruction and things like that in it. And uh, we were hosting and supporting that for Mercy for five bucks um, an enrollment there. And this is the change in C or better rate over a two-year period from spring to spring. Uh, historically, before they were using OER, the, the pass rate for this course was hovering around 50%. Um, in 2012, they moved six sections to OER, and it went so well that then they moved all the sections to OER. And this is the spring 13 result. Here is a 60% pass rate. And actually, Tori from Mercy and I just presented new data on this at ELI, was ELI last week, and the pass rate is up over 70% this year in this course. And when I look at that, it makes me start thinking like return on investment kinds of issues. Now, I would love it if somebody could give me four better words than these words that are on the screen here, mad, glad, sad, rad. But they, they are kind of descriptive, right? So if I'm plotting the percentage of students that complete with a C or better, against the amount of money we're asking them to spend on required materials. <laughs> okay? So we would expect, you know, you, the, the you get what you pay for hypothesis is up and to the right. Right? The more I spend, the, the better I'm going to do because you get what you pay for. Um, so if I, if I pay very little but don't learn very much, well, I guess that makes me sad, but I was expecting it. Um, if I pay a lot but learn a lot, well, that, that makes me happy. But if I pay a lot and don't learn very much, then that just makes me angry. And it's wicked if I can, it's awesome if I can pay very little and, and still learn a lot or have, have a large percentage of my class completing with a C or better. 
you know, so here's the, you know, here's the 2011 number, you know, less than 50% passing at 170 per. And here's the 2013 number with 60% passing at $5 per. Right? I think this is a really interesting way to think about this issue. Not just to think about costs, but think about how costs relate to outcomes. Um, these data are from, this, this is 16 pairs of courses um, from some of those same kaleidoscope schools I was showing you a minute ago. This is another paper that we're preparing right now. Um, you know, showing this mad, glad, sad, rad, but without the coloring. But you can see now we're going from zero to $250 and from zero to 100% com completing with a C or better. And it's pretty interesting, right? Because you see, I mean, you see what you'd expect to see. There's a greater variability among the courses using OER. Some of them are better than the best commercial and some of them are worse than the worst commercial. There, there's a greater variability among those because, I mean, the, the materials coming out of kind of the publisher kind of assembly line, we'd expect them to be more similar uh, than OER would be. Um, but the, the cluster on these, the average for this set of materials here is 71% pass rate and the average for these is 74. And actually, um, I meant to do this, but I guess in my sleep deprivation forgot to. If you plot the best fitting line here, it actually goes down and to the right, not up and to the right, like the you get what you pay for hypothesis would suggest. One last example. Have you heard of the Z degree by show of hands? Okay, awesome, good. I get to introduce you to this. So the Z degree is some work we did with um, Tidewater Community College down in Virginia. Um, where basically Tidewater said, we want to replace uh, the commercial textbooks with OER for all the courses in an entire degree program. All of the required courses and a sufficient number of the elective courses that a student who's paying attention when they register can get out without ever buying a textbook. We want to create the world's first all OER degree program. And um, this launched in fall of 2013. And that degree is now 30% cheaper to graduate from than it was in fall of 2012. Just because we subbed out OER for, um, I say, all we did was sub out OER for commercial textbooks. It's quite a bit of work. Um, but, we, but it was a nine month project. We really started seriously working on it in January and we, we launched in, um, in September. So look at, this, look at these data from the institutional perspective for a second, right? Um, when a student drops a course, of course it slows them down on their way to graduation because they have to come back next semester and take it again. But when a student drops the course, there's also a very real financial cost to the institution because if you drop before the add drop deadline, we refund your tuition. Right? So you know, what would happen if we could, what would happen financially for the institution if it turned out that we could decrease the drop rate through the adoption of open educational resources. So this is from the first two semesters, and you can see that the, you know, there are only about 750 enrollments in the, Z, in the OER sections and 23,000 in the other, so there may still be some play in these data. We'll see as they go forward. But if you project these trends out, if you look at the difference in drop rate and project it out to the time when everybody in the degree program is participating and it's not just a pilot where there's one section per course being offered like there was in this first year. You're looking about 182 students who likely would not drop in that future scenario that are dropping now. And if you multiply that out times the percentage of them that are in-state versus out-of-state and what they pay for in-state versus out-of-state tuition, you know, Tidewater is looking at saving, at holding on to a little over $100,000 a year that they would previously have refunded to students that now they're going to keep. So that's a positive outcome for the institution. That's submitted to Ed Policy Analysis Archives, but it's not, uh, hasn't appeared yet. So when you're having trouble sleeping tonight, you need something to bore you out of your mind so that <laughs> you can succeed in sleeping, go take a, take a look at this website. It's impact.lumenlearning.com. I don't dare try to pull it up and show it to you live given the state of the Wi-Fi. But what you'll see here is a range of institutional settings we can grab a little slider and move it back and forth. Things like, what's the average textbook cost for in the courses where you're replacing your commercial textbooks with OER? And 
Oh, what else is on here? I mean, what, what percentage of students are dropping these courses historically? And what percentage of them are passing with C or better historically? And um, Really interesting slider to play with is what percentage of textbook sales in the bookstore actually comes back to the institution as revenue? You play with that slider a little bit. And as you play with those sliders here at the top that are institutional settings, and then there's some kind of research-based settings here at the bottom that look at how many, what percentage more students could we expect to be passing if you're using OER as opposed to commercial textbooks? How do you think the drop rate is going to change? Um, think how, many, how many more credits per term will they take? So if the defaults are too conservative or too aggressive, you can move them around however you want. And then there's some visualizations here that'll move around up and down. Here's a little, you know, here's that uh, mad, glad, sad, rad that'll generate on the fly. And you can see kind of the outcomes of how much money will all the students save over the period of a year? Uh, how much additional tuition revenue will the institution hold on to? Things like that. How are we doing on time? 10 minutes. Okay. I think I only have like 70 slides left. So we're good. <laughs> so, you know, what is it that we're defending? When I say this idea of open is worth defending and we should create an open education infrastructure, what is it that we're defending? Um, I think we're defending, you know, whenever you're talking about infrastructure, you're going to be building stuff on top of that. What are we building on top of it? We're, I think open pedagogy is the thing that we should, that us in this room as instructional designers and as faculty um, are probably the most interested in and care the most about. And I would define open pedagogy as the set of things that you can do when your outcomes, assessments, and resources are open that you can't do when they're not open. And it turns out there's a pretty broad range of stuff hiding inside of there. A um, couple of examples from my own work, just really quickly. Several years ago, I made the choice to open source, to openly license my syllabi and put them in a wiki. And year after year after year, I kept waiting for the students, like, students, you can edit the course syllabus. Like, go in and, and do anything to the please. Just make some kind of change, because it's open. And it's even, it's, it's in a wiki. Like, change it. I think the third year I did this, they finally made the first change to my syllabus. And they added an assignment is the change that they made. They wanted a day where we spent in class doing kind of hands-on demos for each other, and they wanted every person to prepare a demo and come ready to, to talk about that. That was an interesting experience. Um, also, coming back to the point that Dave was making earlier, um, I started asking all my students to, instead of write, you know, typing up their assignments and handing them in to me, go get a blog and publish your work on your blog, and we'll all come read it on your blog. Uh, well, I think it was the first year we did this, uh, one of the student blog posts, um, which was a pretty interesting post, but uh, this post somehow came onto Stephen Downs' radar. And Stephen Downs sent out a link to this student's homework assignment in his newsletter, which goes to about 30,000 people. And so, you know, not 30,000 people came, but something like 1,500 people came and read this student's homework assignment and then kind of followed some links off to some of the other students' homework assignments. And you know, without me saying a word, next week, all of the written work for that class was more thoughtful, longer, <laughs> better researched, better quality, uh, just because of the impact of them doing their work in the open. Um, and you can tell these are all examples from the era when I was at Utah State, when I was doing everything in a wiki. Um, the, the short version of this story, because there's, there's a much longer version, but the short version of this story is this was a graduate seminar on learning objects. Anybody remember learning objects back in the day, right? So, um, so what I really, the student experience that I wanted to create was a bunch of professionals sitting around a table arguing about different topics relating to learning objects where the People will be things like, uh, like a faculty member and an open source zealot and a software developer and a, a VP of product from an educational technology company. And like, I want all these people sitting around arguing about things. I want students to be able to hear that argument. 
And I knew I couldn't actually get people to come in week after week and have exactly the arguments I wanted them to have. So I broke down over the summer and wrote basically a little sitcom for this course where I have all the characters appearing and having the arguments that I want them to have. And I threw it in the wiki because I thought, I'm sure I'm going to spell something wrong and leave off some punctuation and something else, and maybe the students will clean that up for me. I'm putting everything in the wiki at this point anyway. I'll just I'll put this in the wiki. Well, you know, so I did that over the summer, and I, I greatly concerned my wife because she would walk in, and I'd be sitting there laughing, and she'd say, what happened? I'd say, oh, this person in my sitcom just said something really funny. <laughs> and she's like, aren't you the one writing what she's saying? Like, why is it so funny? Um, Anyway, we got into the school year, and third or fourth week of the class, I was going back and rereading what I'd written so I'd be ready for the discussion in class. And I found a character that I didn't recognize in my sitcom. <laughs> and it, it turned out that there was a K-12 teacher perspective um, that should have been represented there that it didn't occur to me to represent. And one of the students had clicked the edit tab at the top and introduced Tina, the teacher, into the conversation and just started writing her in. And other people picked up on that and multiple people wrote Tina during the term, but it's not something that I anticipated happening or wanted to have happen or planned on happening. It was better than any of the things I had planned on or wanted or hoped would happen. And this led me to believe um, that openness facilitates the unexpected. There's a certain humility about being open that says, this does pretty much what I think I want it to do, and I'm going to put it out here, but you may be able to do something even better with it. And I don't want to keep you, I don't want to prevent you from doing that. So whatever it is that Mark can figure out that's better than what I figured out, I'm going to make it open so that you can make that thing happen, like creating Tina and, and putting her in the sitcom. Two more quick examples. Um, PM for ID is a project management for instructional designers textbook. This is a course I used to teach um, when I was still full time at BYU. There is no textbook called project management for instructional designers. You all know that, right? It's just too niche of an area. So what we did for this class over the course of a couple of semesters was we started with an open project management book written for business school context. <laughs> And then kind of to Dave's point earlier today about letting students kind of pick and choose the things that they're interested in, break the students up into teams and say, okay, you three, how would you like to make this book better? Let's change this book in ways that make it more applicable to us in the field. So one group of students would go through and rewrite all of the little yellow box pull-out case examples or case studies. You know? So instead of saying you need to get three million tons of rebar and so much concrete to Singapore and they're coming from here and from here and whatever it was, they'd rewrite it to be about managing different vendors on a textbook production contract. Right? And it turns out you actually have to understand the content pretty deeply to be able to write a meaningful example that highlights the concepts that really want to be highlighted there. Um, another set of students went through and did video interviews with three different actual practicing project managers that manage instructional design projects created a three-minute video clip for each chapter, those went into the book. Things like that. So over, over a series of semesters, this book went from being a, just a normal project management book to being a project management for instructional designers book with a set of, you know, I don't remember how many now, student co-authors who have listed on their Vita that they're a co-author on this textbook that is used in multiple the programs around the country. Same kind of thing for this book, an open education reader. Um, I, I won't talk about it for the sake of time, but a very similar kind of experience where we pulled together open readings that were core to the topic of open education, and the students did some annotating and summarizing and uh, some things there that were interesting. So kind of winding down. What is it we're defending? Why are we trying to defend it? I think one of the most important reasons for us to want to defend open is because open re-professionalizes the professoriate. If you ever get the chance to hear Jason Pickavance from Salt Lake Community College talk about this, he's super articulate. And you know, it, you, you'd be well served by listening to him talk about it. But not just faculty, it also re-professionalizes us as instructional designers as well. Right? Because in a world of all commercial content, my options as instructional designer are to choose or to make something whole cloth. 
right? Open licenses give me a much broader range of possible activity. It makes me the experimenter. I can generate the hypotheses. I can gather my own data. When I can see what's working, what doesn't work, I can actually go in and fix it and make it better and continuously improve it and be involved in that process directly instead of waiting you know, two, two years from now when Pearson releases the new update to the book. Uh, hopefully they'll fix that thing that, that I found that was broken in it. And you know, stop abdicating all these responsibilities that are rightfully our responsibilities to publishers and take them back and be able to work on them ourselves. Two quick uh, admonitions are about closed platforms and particularly here I'm thinking about the, the so-called next-gen adaptive something platforms. Um, you know, uh, the one question to ask about these platforms is, has the vendor locked everything up in order to make the material teacher-proof? Like, even as big an idiot as you, yeah, I'm pointing at you, Cormier, not even you can screw this up when you deliver it to students, because we have totally locked it down, both through copyright, through DRM, through other technologies, so that you cannot mess with it. Um, when you see that kind of behavior, that kind of attitude that doesn't respect local knowledge, local values, your skills as a professional, that should cause you concern. Now, the second thing I would say here is, um, you know, this kind of trust me, I'm from the government kind of approach to the adaptive algorithms. Is there some secret all rights reserved algorithm that's magically somehow adapting to what your students need, but you're not allowed to know how it works? Trust me. There's, there's good, moral, positive things happening inside the black box. If that's the story, you should be concerned. A um, couple, three or four concluding slides kind of about the ethic of open. Again, coming back to why, why should we care? Why should we be defending this? Um, this idea that openness facilitates the unexpected and that it represents some humility on our part and it, enabling the serendipitous kind of reciprocity where if you put goodness out, goodness comes back to you. If you've published things in the open, uh, you've seen that happen. I'm sure you've seen it happen. You know, this idea of do unto others, a kind of golden rule of open. Right? Add more value to the commons than you take out of the commons. Make it easier for the next guy or gal who comes along. Whatever it is you're doing, the next person that comes along to do it, it should be easier for them than it was for you. Because you just did it. And why would you kind of keep that hidden somewhere locked on your hard drive and make it equally hard for the next person that comes along? Like you've inherited some great stuff from the open community. You know, put something back in. This idea of retain again. I, I, I really almost believe, I'm only exaggerating a little, but I almost believe this kind of movement toward access, access, access is kind of a war on ownership of private property. Like we don't want you to have DVDs. We don't want you to have CDs. We don't want you to have something that you can listen to and then resell to someone else because that person's going to buy from you and it's not going to generate any revenue for us. We'd rather you just stream everything and never actually own it, never be able to resell it, never be able to do a bunch of other things with it. We just want you to access it. We never want you to own it. If you can't 5R it, you don't own it. And you should really care about defending those 5R permissions and your rights to engage in those activities. And then kind of this idea of proxy selfishness, right? Be selfish on behalf of others. Um, maximize your own potential to be useful and empower yourself. You know, the, thing about, the great thing about open is that all the good selfish things that you would do to try to maximize student learning, to improve your academic freedom as, you know, in terms of the kinds of things you can do, the kinds of assignments you can assign and ask of students. If you just do those things in the open, Everything you do to make your life better can make other people's lives better too. And there's goodness there. So pay it forward and be grateful for all the good work that other people in the open space have done that has kind of come down to us from them. Okay, so great, David. Yes, okay, you've convinced me that I should like care about defending open. What should I do? Three things you should do. The first thing, easiest thing you can do is open your, put an open license on your syllabus. Openly license your learning outcomes. Super easy. You can contribute your outcomes to the commons that way you'd be maybe not amazed, or maybe you would be amazed, how few sets of reasonable quality learning outcomes there are that have open license on them. Second thing you can do, 
Replace your commercial textbook with open educational resources. Oh my gosh, the impact on students, the impact on the institution, the impact on you and what you can do is amazing. And then the third thing, and this of course is one that scares the heebie-jeebies out of everybody, open your assessments, particularly if you have performance assessments. Open the performance assessments, right? Like, if the performance assessment is like make nine free throws out of 10, like open, opening that so that people know about it ahead of time doesn't really let them cheat. Either they can make nine free throws out of 10 or they can't. And if you have, big, if you have collections of items, contribute those to open item banks. We're just wrapping up a grant right now funded by the Hewlett Foundation that's created a seed kind of pool of openly licensed test items for 20 high enrolling courses. So each of those will have about 400 items in them when they're done. And then you can contribute yours into there and grow that pool bigger and bigger and bigger. So hopefully there's a couple minutes left for questions. Um, but that's, that's uh, what we prepared. I don't want to, I, I want to, um, it's okay. It's okay, let's have some questions. I saw you first, Paul. I have a question on revenue now, and I, I've seen the evidence too that students stay in classes if they don't have to pay excessive amounts for textbooks. Mm -hmm. But on the other side is the lost revenue that colleges see from them not buying the book, in, not buying a book in the bookstore. And you know, it, I'll just give you an example. At our school, we're a Barnes and Noble bookstore. Mm -hmm. If you go to Barnes and Noble either the website or their physical store and buy the same exact textbook, it's 20 to 30% less than in our own bookstore. Mm -hmm. So that is revenue that's basically going to the college in one way or another. So, so can we, is there, a, is there a study that says, yes, you're going to lose this revenue on the book side end, mm -hmm. but you're more than going to make up for it yeah, on the other yeah. revenue way. So two things I'd recommend to you. One, there's a great infographic that NACS, the National Association of College Stores, published two or three years ago. It's a, it's a dollar bill, and it's cut vertically into little pieces depending on how much of the dollar goes to where. And um, it shows the amount, of, the amount that's kept locally that doesn't go to the publisher or distribution or the author, and how much of that goes to paying employees, to keeping the lights on, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the percentage that goes back to the institution as profit, and it's less than two cents on the dollar. That's the, the, the national average across all the, the, the NACS stores. Um, if you go to that impact.lumenlearning.com thing and play around with that, I think it's set pretty conservatively. I, I think the default there is 4% revenue on you know, four cents on the dollar returned to the institution as profit. You can play with that slider and look at how much money you potentially lose, but you'll also, you'll see that right in the context of how much tuition revenue you're not refunding because of changes in drop rate and how much additional tuition revenue you're gaining because students are taking extra credits. And you, I don't, I don't even think it's possible to set those sliders in a way that it comes out a net negative. It's just so little revenue, so little actual profit coming back to the school. Of course, you're paying people to work there, you're paying you know, infrastructure and whatever. But when you look at the actual profit returned into a scholarship fund or something like that, probably less than 2% and you're making way more than that on additional tuition revenue somewhere else. Yeah, Dave? Oh, no, sorry, right here. Sorry. Um, real open-ended question here. Uh, you know, we focused on textbooks and obviously that's incredibly important. You know, kind of thinking back over my own experience um, from teaching, I feel like what the publishers want even more than to sell us textbooks and sell our students textbooks is to sell like the course modules and the actual learning activities, the content. I mean, I remember the publisher's rep walking in to my yep. office 10 years ago and saying, you know, you don't have to build all that online course stuff. Well, we've got a cartridge for you. We'll uh -huh. just give that to you. And I wonder if you could comment kind of on, on that side of things. Um, so that is an obstacle to adoption of OER in place of commercial textbooks because most of the OER that you find out there aren't prepackaged in ways that make it really easy to get into your learning management system. Um, I've, I've made it almost all the way through this presentation without plugging what my organization, Lumen Learning, does. Um, but you bumped and set to me, so at this point <laughs> I, I have to spike. <laughs> um, 
you know, that's one of the things that we work with institutions to do is to help them get things packaged up and to bring work we've done with other institutions that's already packaged up to you in that format that's already packaged up. If, if you want to talk about that more, talk to, where'd Nate go? Nate, make yourself known. Mm -hmm. talk, talk, talk to Nate about that. It, it is an issue. Somebody needs to play that role. And there's been kind of a void of people playing that role. And that's a role that we are trying to play. In your role with your company that does this service for other people, um, how much resistance are you getting from faculty? Because one of the things that I find in being involved in these projects is that that's the first barrier for entry. It's not that it's not even just going to open. It's switching from whatever they're doing now mm -hmm. to anything that is not what they're doing now. <laughs> yeah. Both from the sense of what change. are you what are you doing in my classroom, but yeah. also the effort that's required to make those kinds of transitions. Yeah, it's the old joke about. We normally tell it about university administrators, right? But how many university administrators does it take to change a light bulb? The question is, change is, is the answer, yeah. So we, um, we, by the time we show up to campus, the president or the provost has already kind of identified a coalition of the willing who are excited about this idea. And they're the only people that we ever talk to, right? Um, and we really focus on institutions that serve low income, first gen, at risk students. and the faculty there see the impact of textbook costs so significantly on their students that it's, there's always more people at those meetings than I expect would have been there. You know, they, even though there's a big switch, there is a switching cost, they, they realize that a third of the students in the room haven't read the homework for today or, you know, or, or whatever, and, and they're willing to do that. Um, I, I don't know if that's, I figure that there might be some selection bias there with the kind of institution that we prefer to work with, but yeah. I just wanted to say that at my last institution, we got a whole group of teachers together to write some content and make a book, and then they turned around and sold it to Pearson, and then Pearson charged us and the students to use it. <laughs> so I, I just want people, if you, you know, you have to be really cautious with, because they'll come and say, we'll help you, we'll make this book, and then you find out you can only use it for free for a year, or you really got to read the small print on these contracts, because in the end we got really, really burned. And, um, and I want to say, though, like the first, after that we started trying to make open, just open books, but then the faculty are like, but wait, it's my content. It's who, got, who owns the copyright, and our biggest, my biggest barrier has been people being willing to share their intellectual property or what they believe is their work. And even though they're paid a salary to work 40 hours a week, they still feel like what they do on the job, they shouldn't have to share openly with everyone. And, and maybe you can address that, that, that issue. It's really common in the US, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would agree that nobody should have to share. If you have to share, we're kind of missing the point. Right? Um, sharing is something you should do because you're generous and you're humble and you want to make the world a better place and you realize it was made better for you by these other people that came before. Um, there are people that will never ever share what they do. They'll go to their graves tightly clutching you know, that manuscript that consequently no one will ever read because they never released it or they only released it through somebody that charged you know, $300 a pop for it or something like that. But you know, my, my opinion on that is just Talk about all the good that open is, and whoever is whoever is kind of a believer in doing that kind of good in the world, work with them. And you don't need to say bad things or negative things or something about people that have other views and feelings on it. Let them go try to change the world the way they want to change the world. Power to them. Um, you just sell the idea on its merits, and whoever comes, work with whoever comes. Um, and on the textbook side, the, and if, if I wanted to be treated like that, I'd write a peer-reviewed article and publish it through Elsevier if I wanted to be treated like that. <laughs> But that's an open access argument. So we always seem to have uh, two somewhat distinct arguments when we try to promote this. One is the economic argument, which is kind of a reaction mm -hmm. um, to our economic environment. And the other is the uh, argument uh, that you also made so well uh, for collaboration, for improvement, and innovation. And I wonder if we'd have more, we, we always tend to emphasize the economic argument. And I wonder if we'd have more success with our faculty if we'd emphasize the creative argument more. Yeah, I, um, 
I think there are multiple arguments, and you really have to know who you're talking to to figure out how to spend the, you know, wh how much time on which side of the argument. Um, I think faculty tend to find the, the change in student success metrics to be a really compelling argument. Um, if that gets connected back to cost, that's kind of interesting, but, you know, there's expansion of academic freedom, there's improved student success, there's, you know, uh, institutional impacts as well. It really just depends on who you're talking to, how you tell the story. Um, I'd say with students, you lead with cost. With faculty, you lead with success and with academic freedom. And with administration, you lead with kind of community PR relationships, um, outreach to alumni who now still have access to, you know, it just, there's, there's so much that's good about open. There's nine different ways you can talk about it. And you really, if you're doing it right, you really ought to customize it to who you're talking to. I say that, but I don't know if I did a good job of doing that today or not. You did a great job of doing it today. Um, I want to ask for your direct help with our college administration. I'm sitting on the promotion tenure committee from my campus, mm -hmm. and the rest of the committee, um, I'm the only one arguing for publications that might be outside the Elsevier um, juried journals. Mm -hmm. So we have faculty who are very good, perhaps, interested in open publication, mm -hmm. who will be um, directly punished for those views. Yeah. If you could help us with our campus presidents and CAOs, having them encourage uh, promotion tenure committees to look toward other than the standard, mm -hmm. you know, since the uh, dawn of time publication in the right. jury journals, we would move ahead quickly. Faculty would love to move along that path, but we are, we are directly stopped from doing so. Yeah, C can I just thumbnail sketch an argument for you quickly that you should try? Um, we, at tenure and promotion, we typically obsess about impact factor, right? That's, that is the coin of the realm, right? What's the impact factor? And we might generalize a little bit into tier one, tier two, tier three publications, but even that is based on impact factors, right? So you know, go back and look at the math. H how do you calculate an impact factor? It's, it's, it's citations divided by the total number of articles, but right, it, it, it's very simple math. And what does that math tell you? That math gives you an estimate of the future citations that your article might receive, because in the past, other articles in that journal have received that number of citations. So it's basically a, um, it's a proxy for the impact of your article. So for a long time, that proxy was the best we had. But now there's something called Google Scholar. Have you seen Google Scholar? Do you have an account on Google Scholar? I don't, and I bet my CAO doesn't I bet he doesn't. Um, let me see how fast I can do this if it takes, well, um, no, I'm not going to do it. If you, um, if you go to Google Scholar and create an account and get all of your publications pulled in there, what you'll see is Google goes out and crawls all the journals and gives you the actual citation count for your articles instead of a proxy estimate of the possible citation impact of your articles. Right, so the impact factor is this kind of indirect estimate of what your impact might be. But you can actually just go to Google Scholar and get now, granted, there's a little noise in the Google Scholar data, um, but I think it's pretty, it's generally pretty well respected. Um, and if, if I were to pull up my page on Google Scholar, you would see of my top 20 highest cited things, probably 11 of them were in peer-reviewed outlets. I mean peer-reviewed peer -reviewed outlets at all. Some of them are blog posts that have been cited in peer-reviewed research 50 however many times, right? So this argument that we have to keep relying on the impact factor, because in the past, that indirect proxy estimate was all we had, so that was great. We used it then. It's a different world now. And instead of taking an indirect estimate, we can actually directly measure impact. And if what we care about is impact, then let's just go to Google Scholar and count it up. And who cares whether it was in this journal or that journal on your blog? Because ostensibly, what we care about is impact. And that's the argument. You can say, do we care about impact or do we care about something else? And if it's something else, tell me what it is. If it's impact, I can measure it directly here. That, 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 I did that with my promotion and tenure committee. 
and I got tenured, and then I quit. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, David. So I'm sorry to cut the conversation short with David, but you will be here during lunch, right? And Nate is also here. Um, I also wanted to mention before we head out to lunch, which is again in the same place that we were yesterday, which is over behind the bar, um, if there are any statistics or basic computer science faculty here, you have the opportunity to um, have lunch with Candace Till, who will be our, um, our keynote speaker right after lunch. And so I would encourage you, Bill and um, um, Dan and whoever else is in here um, that teaches either statistics or basic computer science to um, find Candace's table, we have it marked, um, and have lunch with her. And then also um, uh, we can have a couple of OER tables to continue the conversation on OER. Um, so uh, let's come back. Um. <laughs> right, right. Um, sorry, Ken. Um, so we'll be back here um, uh, in an hour for the, for, uh, the next keynote. Thank you.